Thank you. The Gospel lesson today is from St. Matthew's Gospel, the 24th chapter, beginning at verse 36. <clears throat> Jesus is speaking to his disciples. But about that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken <clears throat> and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if, what the owner of the, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an unexpected hour. Here ends the Gospel. I want to read to you something that was written by um, William Willimon, who's formerly dean of the chapel at Duke University. He was watching television, and he heard this. You see this lock? And people think that in buying this expensive lock, they can keep me out. But watch me. With just a couple of flicks of the wrist, a wire inserted here and twisted this way, the lock opens. The television home show was focusing on the theme of home security. In order to help them focus on the theme, they had enlisted the services of a twice convicted burglar, an expert on getting around the best home security systems. And after opening the expensive lock, the burglar proceeded to show how he could get in a window, get a window open without breaking it, even though the window had been locked. He moved from there to show how to disarm an elaborate and expensive home security system. Apparently, there was just about no way to keep this criminal genius out of your home. He knew how to get around every security device imaginable. Is there no security, no possibility of safety, I asked myself? Apparently not. We like to think that our burglar alarms, our expensive locks, our security lights enable us to be secure, and yet, we are inherently frail and vulnerable creatures who long for security but rarely achieve it. Is nothing safe? Apparently not. No security. It can't be true, can it? It can't be true. There's nothing more dear to the human way of thinking than a secure life, a secure situation, a secure home. We really believe that we can eliminate most fears of the future by arranging our own security, by paying attention to being secure. Even, and maybe especially, in our religious life, our life of faith, we are like to arrange it so there are no surprises. Just the regular ways of God, the ways that are known to us, the ways that we know are sure ways. We want signs to reinforce what we already know. Even in matters of faith, we like the sure, the tangible, so that we can be secure in our beliefs. There's all those stories about them finding relics or like the Shroud of Turin and other things, or any archeological find that proves that what we've believed about scripture is actually true. It actually happened, it was there. We'd like to know that. As long as what they find fits the story that we know and believe. You know that phrase, God is in his heaven and all is right with the world? You've heard it many times, right? I, I offer a new translation. I think that phrase should be said, God is in his or her heaven. Or better yet, God is in my heaven. God is in control, there will be no surprises, the Bible tells it all, so all is right in my world. Because I think actually that's how we think about things. 
But then we have today's gospel coming to us uh, to put into the mix of our ideas about security. Now, the book of Matthew was written about 60 years after all the events of Jesus Christ. And Matthew is talking to a church that is waiting for Christ's return, which was the promise, they thought. And also, the church was getting tired of it. You know, if somebody said to you, uh, I'm going to give this to you, and all you have to do is wait 60 years, <laughs> you would say, gee, thanks, that was really nice of you. Uh, it's like when you, when you were a little kid and your mother said, now, if you get good grades, or your father, you get good grades and you're a good child for the next semester, then at the end of the semester, I'll have a special surprise for you. A semester? When you're a kid, a semester might as well be 10 years, man. That's a long time to wait for something. I think that's the way we think about a lot of things. His return, you see, the promise to the church was it would confirm all the church's beliefs and practices. Anything the church believed and the church did when Jesus returned, that would all be confirmed. And we would say, boy, we're good, aren't we? We knew just what to do. And it's the same today. The church hasn't really changed that much. In fact, even in this morning's communion liturgy, we say, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And you'll notice it's not in the liturgy, but when? But when? And you know, there are those who predict the end of the world, the second coming, and quite frankly, it's a major money maker. You go into a bookstore, especially the more conservative bookstores, there's a whole section on prophecy. And some of these guys have done, and women, have done all the analysis you can imagine to tell us when the world is going to end, when Jesus' second coming is upon us. And they're all the signs that they've talked about. And what they tell us is that at that moment, the power of God is going to smash into history it's not going to come gently. It's going to come powerfully uh, into history and make every aspect of life into a simple black and white situation. That's one of the great things about biblical prophecy, you see. And why so many authors want to write about this and so many people must be buying those books. The last store I was in, there were ten shelves of prophecy. And if you laid all those books out, I wonder what kind of an analysis you would make about how many times the Lord is coming in different ways by all these different authors. And they've all used only the Bible, of course, nothing else to tell us when the end of the world is. And when that coming happens, you see, then there's going to be good versus evil. You know those gray areas that you and I live most of our lives in? At least I do. Almost everything I live in is gray. It's not black or white. It's somewhere in the middle. But that's all going to be gone. And good is going to win everything. And evil will disappear completely. And that's the kind of world we would really like. Some administrations have even used that idea in foreign policy. The good guys are going to ride in and wipe out evil. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. There's nothing like this in our experience. We have no evidence that anything like this will ever happen, that the gray will be wiped away, the confusion and the tough decisions that we have to make, and the suffering and the pain that some people suffer, and we don't understand why. There's no evidence that we are going to be able to live without that, even though that's what we want. And the early church not only wanted it, they waited for it. They believed that they would not die before they saw this happening 2,000 years ago. And there are so many points in history where some proclaim the signs of the second coming. Every new millennium, you know, that's the, day, that's the time. God is going to come in this new millennium. You remember the um, Y2K thing? Planes were going to be crashing. All your money was going to be soaked up by the banks. 